thing. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our third part of our series of webinars uh, brought to you by Q Latrobe and Greenacres Golf Clubs. I've got the wonderful honour tonight of presenting to you Sir Ian Botham, uh, somebody who certainly doesn't need any introduction. So welcome, Beefy. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Um, My pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's 9.30 or roughly early morning for you, Tia. It's uh, 7.30 yeah. night time for us. I'm, I'm actually holding up fishing to go to do this. So there you go. I'm actually fishing on the river. Ah, oh, beautiful. Well, hopefully you catch a few for us. So that'll be wonderful. Uh, we've got one nice one yesterday. So, yeah, we'll see. Beautiful. Uh, Ian, if I could cast your mind back just to, you know, first time back in Australia. Oh, sorry, first time in Australia, uh, back in 1977, <laughs> your first visit. Um, yeah. You came out on a white bread scholarship and you played cricket for Melbourne University. Uh, one of your first games, if not the first, against Northcote. And uh, wasn't the greatest of, of innings or matches for you, but from memory, eight overs bowled, taking none for 85, and uh, with the ball and with the bat, a diamond duck. <laughs> yeah, I saved my best for the big arena. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't too worried about that. But no, uh, no, the... Um, I think my, I averaged about six with the bat, about 48 with the ball. And we only played a few games because it was one of the wettest uh, summers on record. So, um, yeah, no, but I had great memories. I taught the lads how to drink a yard of ale. I showed them how to do the boat race. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of good times. I, I enjoyed it. And, I, and when I come back to Melbourne, I try and catch up with a few of the guys as well. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many a cricket eating nation would have hope that that sort of uh, form continued throughout your career, but uh, gladly it didn't and history was certainly made. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're revered by all. Uh, you, we love to hate you. We hate to love you. And we certainly see you as one of us here in Australia. Now, what is it that makes us Aussies think of you as one of our own? Uh, look, I don't know. Maybe the way I play the game uh, or played the game in past tense. Um, it's like everything. Uh, if I play a game of golf, I want to win. If I play, when I play cricket, I wanted to win. When I played football, I wanted to win. So um, it's just in my nature. And I admire the, and I've always admired uh, the Australians. You think of it, uh, the whole of Australia would fit into inside the M25 in, in the UK, population wise. And it's, um, I have to say that uh, for what you guys achieved, uh, is really quite remarkable and I've always respected it and I think that if I was in the trenches I wouldn't mind having an Aussie one side and a Kiwi the other I'd feel quite <laughs> safe oh, that's but, um, I, I love the country uh, I do quite a bit of work down there now with the wine business uh, sadly I'm, I should be traveling about now uh, beginning of November I should be on my way down there but obviously circumstances have uh, altered all those plans so fingers crossed I can get down in the new year yeah, well, Australians certainly think of you as, as one of our own. And, and if I could just uh, repeat a quote. Well, I've got a, few, got a couple of convictions now, so I should make me uh, very eligible. <laughs> we'll talk about those in a minute. But uh, one of the, when we announced this uh, webinar series, you know, we've had, uh, you're the last in the series of three. We've had a gold medalist, a Victoria Cross mm -hmm. recipient, and now mm -hmm. a Sir Baron Lord. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. members sent back saying, what a wonderful initiative, three great Australian icons. What an opportunity. Can't wait to see them all. So there we, you go. we thank you as one of us. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll accept that. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I'm just going to pop up a photo now, and I guess it's self-explanatory, but, you know, this is about Sir Ian Botham in itself. And if you could just run through those photos and just give us your thoughts about each one of those, some special moments. Well, the one with my wife and uh, my two grandsons, Regan on the uh, on my left uh, of the picture, the eldest one, and the shorter one in the middle. Uh, he's he's now playing for he's in the Welsh squad, uh, rugby union, playing for Cardiff Blues. He's six foot four and he's built like the proverbial brick house. Um, <laughs> so um, no, that 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 always good memories. That was the knighthood. Uh, then uh, one of the more uh, so I say um, the Queen was fantastic. She gave me my knighthood, we had a conversation, and um, she's a, a remarkable woman. She really is a remarkable woman. And uh, then I'm dressed up in my robe. So, yeah, it's been a – who would have thought that 20 years ago? So, uh, yeah, 
all good memories. Yeah, I mean, if we look at the bottom photo on, on the right, and, and I say this with all the respect I can muster, you know, what is it like kneeling down in front of the Queen, sword in hand, she's about to knight you, putting that over your shoulder? Uh, it was absolutely probably one of the most um, wonderful moments of my life. My family were there to see it. Uh, sadly, when I went for the uh, to get my uh, into the House of Lords, my peerage, um, you couldn't have family there because of the current circumstances yeah. uh, in the world, not just in England, but everywhere. So um, that that was uh, different. But uh, the, to kneel in front of the Queen and have a conversation, I've met the Queen quite a few times, uh, but to uh, that moment was very very special. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, you mentioned before uh, about your wine business, and you know. I'll just show mm. a bit here, and if we could touch a little bit on that, uh, you've partnered up with Jeff Merrill, a great winemaker, and uh, you've also branched out into some gins. and And I love the you know the mentioning in, or the references, sorry, in cricket. Yeah, it's twenty two yards, the cricket pitch, and the eighty one series, and that's obvious. We'll certainly touch base on that. But uh, your wines, what got you into wines? Uh, look, wines. Um, I've been practicing on wines for about forty five years. So, uh, and Jeff Merrill uh, is a great, great friend, uh, a fantastic mate over the years, uh, just a wonderful guy. And uh, to lean on Jeff a bit and to find out a bit more about wine, it was a privilege. But, um, you know, to make the wines, to blend these wines around Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, uh, and we're going into Spain as well, um, it, it's, it's, it's mind blowing, to be honest, how quickly it's grown. So. It keeps us all very busy. Um, it's given me, to, to be honest with you, uh, commentating for, what, 23 years? After playing for uh, X number of years, I can't even work that one out. Uh, retiring at 37, then going straight into television for the next 23 years. Um, it was also, it was quite nice to just walk out of the studios, fittingly against Australia last, uh, last September in the UK. Uh, to retire on that note, I felt was um, appropriate because the Australians, for me, uh, as I said to you, I admire them uh, tremendously for their sporting achievements. Um, the wine business is great; it's not good for the waistline, as you can see from that picture. <laughs> but um, but you know that's half the fun, isn't it? So uh, no, look, I, I love the wine business. I love wines. I love trying wines, and, I, and Joe blending them is a dream come true, really, for me. Um, it's given me a, a new, uh, hopefully the next 10, 20 years uh, of enjoyment. Um, time will tell, but uh, no, we're very pleased, very proud of the wines. The wines that I've done, uh, blended, are all wines that I've put on my own table. So there's no Sauvignon Blanc, because I ate it. Yeah. <laughs> Not having that, no, that's gone. Um, but everything else is what I would put on my own table. and. Uh, uh, the Argentinian range, which we're just bringing out now, is, it was good fun. The boys came over just before uh, the shutdown over here uh, from Argentina, and we did some blending in, in my front room, with, or it's in the conservatory. And it's just opened so many more avenues for me. It's exciting. Excellent. So what's the, uh, the go-to wine? What's your wine of choice? Well, uh, this time of the morning, usually I abstain <laughs> until about midday. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're fishing, that's not always. You always toast the river every morning. Yes. So, but that's the dram. Uh, but uh, no, uh, look, I, I like all the wines. Uh, I actually had, uh, yes, definitely, I caught a, a fantastic fish. And um, I sat down and had a glass of my rosé, uh, which nice. was uh, English rosé. Uh, it comes from Hush Heath in Kent. Um, and also do a sparkling with them. So it, it's, it's it, we're in 14 countries, I think, now. But we're actually making wine in Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, uh, England. And, the, and Spain to come. So, you know, it, it's, it's a world, it's a little bit like cricket really, traveling all the time, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, your charity efforts, I'd love to touch base on that because they certainly are legendary. And I'd be really keen to find out what was the driving force behind your charity efforts? How did you start? What was it that made you go there? Um, it's, it's quite simple actually, I saw children uh, dying. Um, that's me or mate, AB. It is, uh, yes. but, Yeah, uh, AB came on the walks. He's done some walks with us. And in actual fact, he and, uh, and very sadly passed away Dean Jones, uh, which was a great shock to us all. Um, most, uh, none of us could, well, I still can't get my head around it. 
But um, A, B and Dino, we were at, uh, in Brisbane and I'd finished one of my walks and I was over there and I went to A, B and I said, you two guys need to get off your backsides and do something over here. And they did and fair play to them. Um, a, B went from uh, Brisbane to Sydney uh, and Dino then did, uh, I think it was Sydney or to Melbourne or whatever. Yeah, it was a fantastic effort. You know, they walked a thousand kilometers, whatever it was, raised a lot of money. Uh, then, of course, Merv walked from Federation Square to the MCG. Took him about two weeks. But, um, yeah, <laughs> but, but, but uh, no, it was great. And I just saw children dying. I broke my foot against the Aussies in uh, 77 at uh, Headingley. And when I went into the hospital, uh, I had to go through the uh, children's department to, to get to the uh, physio department. And I'm walking through with the club doctor and I said to David, I said, you know, these guys, these fellas here look all right. These ones playing, they're playing one of those board games, Monopoly or whatever. And uh, he said, well, actually, they're very ill. Uh, in fact, you've got about eight weeks treatment. Those guys, little fellas, will probably won't be here in eight weeks time. I said, really? And he said, you have leukemia. And I'd never heard of leukemia in 1977. So he explained it to me in layman terms. It's cancer of the blood. And uh, when we did the first ever walk, uh, a couple of years after that, so I started sponsoring the, um, the parties that the uh, kids were given just before they passed away, because they were so um, drugged up of painkillers, et cetera, that um, they uh, didn't really know what it was Christmas or their birthday, it didn't matter, it was a party. And um, we paid for that, myself and Kath, uh, for quite a while. And then in the mid eighties, I thought this is a bit negative. What about doing something positive? And that's how we came up with the idea of the walks. My wife thought I was gonna do something uh, sensible like uh, London to Brighton. And I announced uh, that I was doing John O'Groats to Land's End. Now, my geography wasn't too great in those days. And I didn't realize it's 400 and odd miles from John O'Groats to the English border, then another 600 down to uh, Land's End. So anyway, we did it, it took off, raised lots and lots of money. We raised over a million pounds in the mid 80s just in the buckets without all the pledges, et cetera, et cetera. So we made enough money to build the, uh, the hospital, uh, the research center rather, outside, just outside Glasgow. And uh, those are the real guys because in those days it was a 20% chance of survival. And through the work that uh, we've been able to fund through many walks, 17 in total, and other fundraising events, we've actually been able to fund their research. And uh, consequently, now we were very pleased to uh, announce two or three years ago that it had gone from 20% chance of survival to 94% chance. That's a massive leap in a short period of time with a former cancer. And it's opened other doors for other cancer research. So uh, very proud of the work we've done. I had a fantastic bunch of mates who came with me, uh, the girls, the boys, that, that, um, Basically, they organize the walk. I do the walking, that was the easy part. But 18 months of organization for every walk, councils, police, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it had to go through the, the mill every time. And uh, so we've got a loyal bunch. Most of the guys and girls that did the 17 walks for me did all of them or pretty close to all of them. They um, got addicted to it. And they, uh, you know, they blocked off their three or four weeks a year and came and did the walks with me, whether they were driving the baggage to the hotel, checking the hotel in, uh, whether they were uh, collecting money, whatever. They, but they're a fantastic bunch of people and uh, I couldn't have done it without them. So you know, there's a big feather in their uh, caps as well. So we're still ongoing. Uh, we've now been able to expand a bit and we've got the foundation and uh, we have about six or seven charities but then if we get a, someone requesting something we had not long ago for a special unit for babies in Belfast and we funded that. So uh, it, it's been, it was hard work doing the walks, but um, believe me, it gives you a lot of satisfaction to see the results. It, uh, the previous photo I just touched base was uh, the Sri Lankan walk. Um, I'm not too sure of the year, I think it might be 2011 or 13, was it? Yes, and, around there, yeah. <clears throat> and the other photo with you and AB that was taken last year at uh, the Q Golf Club with the charity day down there. So uh, all the members watching tonight would be certainly familiar with that photo. Yeah, yeah, um, that was uh, for the firefighters. Um, yeah. And we got a great response in uh, Q. Um, well, hopefully I'll see a few of those members when I get back in 
hopefully, the new year. No, that'll be wonderful to see. Um, this next photo, now nobody's going to know this person in the next photo. Well, I certainly know one of them. Now, the young fellow on the right there, I'm going to take poetic license. That is my son, Lachlan. Now, Lachlan had the yeah. wonderful pleasure of catting for you at one of your charity days at Woodlands Golf Club uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, yeah, you can yeah. tell by his face he's he's as happy as Larry. He was chuffed at the bit and loved every minute of it. I'm just not too sure whether he, he loved the fact that he was caddying for you or whether it was the pineapple you put in his pocket for caddying for him. So he talks no, about that photo regularly. I, I, I introduced him to a couple of glasses of wine as well, I think, if I remember rightly. But yeah, that no, is good on actual, it. Well, it's a fact, but we're not recording this. But yes, that actually did happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful yeah, memory that uh, I'll certainly never forget. Me. And uh, we talk about that photo often. Good, um, good I want to get into a bit of cricket. Um, cast your mind back to 1981, the third test at Headingley. I mean, who could forget that test? Um, obviously, we would have loved to have seen the, the reversal of the, the outcome. But however, first innings, six for 95 and 50 with the bat. Fantastic, uh, fantastic innings. Second innings, 149 off 148 balls and really set the match up. I've got a couple of videos, I'll split them up and I want to talk about this first video first and just get your feeling. I'm sure that every person listening to this and watching tonight would love to be able to feel what you felt that day. If we just have a look at this video coming up now. by Ian Botham. 50 in the first innings, a century in the second and six wickets. A marvellous all-round performance to match some of the others he's produced for England. And <laughs> Bring back some special memories, no doubt. Yeah, well, there's Richie commentating. Um, there was Graham Dilley still on the balcony and Bob Willis, and uh, they're all sadly departed now. But um, no, great memories, great, great memories. Um, uh, fantastic menu, uh, memories, to be honest. Something that, and also it was a weird time because England was having all kinds of problems over here. We had the miners' strike, we had race riots, cities on fire. And uh, the country, I think it came at the right time, it certainly changed my life, 1981, but uh, I, I think it came at the right time for the country. And uh, I think a lot of people um, needed a lift. And I think that series gave them that. And it was packed, it was uh, filled to the rafters, all the grains, all the grounds. It was a great series. And, um, you yeah, know, that, that, that was a... It wasn't a great pitch, that pitch we played on there, because we bowled Australia out for 130 to win it. Well, Bob Willis did, eight for 40-odd. Uh, eight, eight for 45. 15. 40, yeah, 15 overs. Off the, and he bowled, he, he started up the hill, and he actually said to Mike Breed, he said, look, he said, um, when you get golden watch, it's off. Um, any chance of me having the wind and coming downhill? <laughs> and he, he bowled unchanged. Uh, from that end and he needed and he didn't play in that game a lot of people don't realize this but he was very close to being left out uh, because of, he was having problems with no balls and he said no no I'm ready I'm right and uh, Mike really equally I just given up the captaincy yeah. and uh, he, Brias came up to me and said uh, look do you want to play I said do I want to play it's against Australia of course I want to bloody well play you know <laughs> this is what it's all about this is what you live and play cricket for England Australia you know, it's the most watched series in the world. And uh, so uh, it all unraveled from there, really, and uh, it got better and better. Um, but the pitch was, wasn't the best, and, uh, but Bob bowled brilliantly with uh, hostility and pace uh, down that slope, and um, the guy supported him in the field, some good, good uh, catching. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite funny, because we had a young lad in the dressing room uh, attendant. Uh, his name um, was Ricky Roberts, which might not mean much to many people, but if you think that he went on to be caddy and caddied for Ernie Els and still does uh, oh. to major championships, etc. And he was 14 year old 
uh, years old in the dressing room. And at the end of the game, I said to him, Ricky, just go next door. Just tap on the Aussie dressing room and just say, look, you don't need the champagne. Can the English boys have some? Because there's none left. And he went and did it. <laughs> and he came back through our door horizontal. <laughs> I think Ray Bright and Rod Marsh had all of them. <laughs> but uh, no, just um, many great memories from that series, yeah. Well, I want to touch base on the on the second innings just briefly. And I think you're uh, being a little bit kind by saying it wasn't a great pitch. It must have been a fair pitch with you know, 149 off 148 balls with the bat. But the second innings, you took one for 14. And you did mention before, you're very dear, mate. Bob Willis, eight for 43 on 15 overs. Mm. So I play this video. I don't think it gets too much more special than what's about to happen on this video. If you just watch this. I look forward to watching it. Oh, what a good catch. Everything is running for both of them. Runs, wickets and catches. And the Australian captain goes for naught. For both of them, Bob Willis. Hughes is gone. And it's 58 for three. I think anything, anytime you can get the Australian captain out uh, for a duck, you catching and, and your very good friend Bob Willis bowling the ball, wouldn't it get too much uh, better than that, I would have thought? No, we had, um, we, we, look, he, Bobby was more than uh, a mate. He, he was uh, confident. You know, I, if I had any problems, he was the first person to ring me up and vice versa. Um, I sadly uh, sat with him just um, a couple of days before he passed. Uh, and, you know, it's not a day goes by, I don't think about Bob. He, we, were, we were very, very close friends. And um, no, sadly missed the whole world, the cricketing world will miss him, believe me. But um, no, he was fantastic. He, he was, um, no one ever really gave him the credit he deserved. He's one of the best quick bowlers that have ever played the game. If you think of the amount of games we played as well, for him to get 300 and odd wickets, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. He nearly died on the operating table and a thrombosis when he's in one of the many knee operations. Um, a bit like Spaghetti Junction, he's uh, just uh, scars everywhere. Uh, but um, no, he was a great fighter, he was, a, I think, a terrific bowler, and most importantly, a fantastic mate. He was now. This next photo, obviously, with the 81 series. Um, that's coming up now. Nobody needs introduction to these two fellows. But <laughs> infamous in the uh, the bet, 500 to 1. When did, you, <laughs> when did you learn of this and what was your first thought? Well, my first thoughts were, why the hell wasn't I on it? But I was out there <laughs> patting. I didn't have any joints. So, so I was pretty <laughs> pretty annoyed about that, that factor. But uh, no, two good mates. Um, one of the best bowlers that's ever lived. And Bacchus, well, he's just uh, larger than life, uh, Rod. He's um, fantastic. Catch up with those guys whenever I can, whether we play golf or, or I went out with, actually last time I was in Perth, I rang up uh, DK and uh, he turned, right, I'll meet you at Sunset's restaurant, right, tonight, blah, blah, blah. So I went there and he arrived with this like shopping uh, trolley full of wine. <laughs> he said, I'm not sure which one we'll try, but I thought we'd bring a selection. And uh, he, he he used to have one of the um, one of the biggest collections of um, uh, Cabernet from uh, Mosswood, uh, one of the great winemakers. And uh, he he, uh, he used to have that uh, collection. It's gone. Well, it's, it's been it's been whittled away, shall we say, over the years. And consumed. Uh, but no, they were great guys. And the first time I realised about the bet was actually when I saw the bus driver coming back after the game. Uh, I noticed him and he had these two, we used to have these big pillar cases to put all your washing in. And uh, when you're on tour, and the Aussies had exactly the same, the Aussie boys. And uh, they came back, it looked like Santa Claus with two sacks over his head, been paid out in cash. Um, <laughs> but um, no, that, that, that was, uh, yeah, I, I was the idiot out in the middle batting, so I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't get a bet on. And it came up on the board, 500 to one. I said, I wouldn't mind a piece of that. And uh, I was with them. Um, I think it was Graham Dillier was out there with me at the time. And uh, anyway, <laughs> none of us did. But we found out later, about 10, 15 years later, we found out that Bob Taylor had had a, a little bet on it and uh, never told us and never bought me a bloody drink either. So, wow. <laughs> so but well, I've, I've got him back since. So don't worry, there's no problems there. But, uh, but no, it was... Um, yeah, that was that was the first time I realised 
the driver for the coach driver was coming back with the stacks over his shoulder. <laughs> um, you touched base on earlier, uh, you know, we recently lost one of our favourite sons, Dean Jones. Um, yeah. You know, we put up this photo and, and certainly uh, he will be sorely missed by everybody. He was, uh, uh, he was a larrikin, he was a lad, he was you know, one of the greatest cricketers we will ever see. And uh, from a one day perspective, no matter what the score was, Dino with the bat, we were still a chance. And he was just a wonderful cricketer. Can you tell us you know, your association and friendship with Dino and just some special moments about him? Well, legend, as we always called him. Um, look, uh, Dino played with me at uh, Durham. In our first, he was our first overseas player uh, when we, we got first class status. Uh, he was magnificent. He he, um, he leads from the front. He never asked anyone to do anything that he couldn't or wouldn't do himself. Uh, no, he, he look, it was such a shock. I was actually in Scotland uh, with my wife. We were driving up to um, the north of Scotland and uh, Rod Loder, my uh, manager, rang me up and said, mate, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, I'm driving. He said, listen, he said, you're going to have to sit down and think about it. Dino has just died. And I said, what? He said, yeah, he had a heart, massive heart attack in Mumbai. And uh, uh, Brett Lee Binger uh, tried uh, everything for about an hour, apparently, to keep him going. But um, you often wonder where the defibrillator was, but that's another story. But, um, but no, a massive loss. Um, his enthusiasm, he loved cricket, he lived for cricket. And... Um, Sadly, he'll be missed by everybody. And there's certainly a, a bit of a shock and horror uh, around Durham when that uh, became public knowledge and people were amazed because he's the last person. He, you know, he's always fit. He always trained. He always went um, doing I remember one year I arrived and he just had a knee operation and he came and um, did this charity thing for the, uh, the MCG. And he couldn't walk virtually. <laughs> so I was I was on crutches after having a back operation. <laughs> he was hobbling around, but uh, he came and did it, and he was in agony. And he actually had to go back in hospital and have the knee fixed again. So, uh, but you know, look, people like Dean Jones don't come along very often. So, to Jane and the girls, um, uh, um, sent them messages. But I'd like to when I get over there. One of the first places I'll go is uh, out into the the bush, in Victoria, and uh, go and catch up with them. Yeah, it was, a, it was a big shock to all of us here in Australia, certainly yeah. seeing the headlines yeah. on the news. And you're right, it's the last person you would have thought that would happen to. It's uh, very sad. Uh, yeah. The other thing I think he would have, he would have liked was, I think uh, I got a, someone sent me, I think it might have been Rod sent me over a uh, picture, and there's a 16-page spread in The Age all about Dean Jones. So he'd have thought, well, he'd been gone his way up there, and then he'd have thought, well, you know, if i got to go, I'm going in style. You know, that's, yeah. that's Dino. But uh, no. Nah. Massive loss to the game of cricket, to his family and everybody that um, played with and against him, adored him. So uh, I, the legend, we, we call him legend as it was. So there you go. Oh, he was certainly one of the, the best one day players in the world. And, and just a didn't a play a test cricket, should have played more, should have played a lot more test cricket. Uh, you know, he averaged like 47, 48 or something in test cricket, or maybe even more actually. But, uh, you know, he, he he, um, he never really got the outings that he deserved. Uh, but it was just a talent, such a talented batting lineup for Australia that um, he was um, he was unlucky not to have played 100 tests. Yeah, I don't think anybody in the test team would have been missed if Dino had taken their place. Mm, That's exactly. Sure. Yeah. Now, you touched base uh, about the MCG and one of your walks. We'll bring up this picture. And this, uh, this has come from a bit of inside information. So... I'd really like to know whether it's rumour or fact, but I was told that you and Dino one day on the MCG happened to be hitting a golf ball and trying to hit it out of the ground. Two Didn't questions. try, we did. Okay, so there's the first question answered you, Dean. What iron did you use? Uh, I think we hit uh, seven irons. And how did all this come about? Uh, do you know, I don't know how it came about. We were out there and uh, next thing... He's wandering around with a golf club, Dino, and uh, to the groundsman's horror, <laughs> we smashed a couple of balls over the top. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he loved his golf. I love my golf. And uh, 
I don't know how it came about, to be honest. He turned up with a golf club and a couple of golf balls. And, well, that's all you need, isn't it? That's it. Why not? Let's see if we can hit one into the Yarra River over the top of the MCG. Yeah, I don't think, luckily, I don't think we caused any accidents on the road. <laughs> but, uh, well, no, but no, no we, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the Upside Down River, I think it made it to the Yarra. But, yeah. yeah. Got a couple of uh, one-word associations, a few names I'll throw to you, and if you could just you know, mm -hmm. briefly explain them. Uh, Warney. The best. Awesome. Alan Border. Toughest guy. Really tough. Great competitor. You'd want him in your side. I can't give him one word, but I'll give you a few words about them. Yeah, that's Alan Border. Yeah. Warney, the best uh, that's ever lived, in, uh, in my opinion. Uh, for what he did, leg spin, etc., and enthusiasm. Uh, Alan Border, tough, really tough. Great buddy, great mate. Uh, we used to call him Captain Grumpy, but uh, Alan Border <laughs> is Alan Border, and he, there should be a statue of Alan Border outside every test ground in Australia because he changed uh, Australian cricket. There you go. Okay, Dennis Lilly. Uh, <laughs> fantastic bowler, fantastic bowler. And uh, the moss would look out, uh, Fot, I'll be back over and I'll be um, tasting it in Western Australia with you soon. Good man, great man, great bowler. Now, Tomo. Lethal. <laughs> now, for Viv Richards, for Re Viv Richards said to, I said to him, because I never played against Tomo uh, before he had his shoulder injury at the Adelaide Oval. And, uh, but I said to Viv, uh, and I said, we sat down one evening, we were talking about quick bowlers. And he just said, uh, hey, beefy man, this, uh, this guy, Toma, is the fastest he'd ever seen. Fastest, he said, ever lived. No one's in that. So you think of the quartets that they turned out, the West Indies in the 80s and the 90s. He said, none of them were as quick as Jeffrey Robert Thompson. Jeez. And um, so, uh, good mate, always he sent me a lovely message uh, on the peerage. Um, but no, um, look forward to catching up with Toma. He's, um, we're sort of a lot, a lot of things in common. We both love our fishing. <laughs> we love our um, larrikin, you know, larrikins playing around with it. Yeah, you know, it's great. It's great. Well, with those two, Dennis Lilly and uh, Jeff Thompson, the duo, you know, from both ends, what was it about them that made that pair so special and I guess so accurate and so lethal to batsmen? Uh, well, they're just exceptional talents. I mean, uh, Tomo, everyone said he had, had this freakish action. If you actually slow it down, it's almost the perfect action. Uh, but he was just a natural athlete, Tomo. He'd rather be on the beach surfing than playing cricket. Cricket sort of got in the way a little bit. And, uh, but he was just a natural uh, bowler. And when, when I first saw him uh, perform and, uh, from my armchair back in the UK, I thought, wow. Yeah, this guy's he got it, and he got bounced from nowhere. But um, now, look, he, he could probably roll up now in a pair of plimsolls and bowl at <laughs> 70, 80 mile an hour now. Uh, but uh, no, he's um, great. Always look forward to playing golf with him, going to a few cold ones. Um, he's just a, a great guy. Great guy. Really, cricket was actually interfered with his social life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dickie Bird. Something a bit off. Mad. Mad. <laughs> What completely barking <laughs> in the nicest way possible. Dicky, he's a one-off Dicky. Um, he's a bit eccentric. Oh, totally, totally. But we used to, uh, we used to, we used to do pranks on him. We used to jack his car up on bricks, and he'd get in the car and they'd turn the engine on. And the wheels would be spinning around. The car not going anywhere. We did all sorts to him. But uh, you know, still probably one of the best umpires that ever lived. Um, if you look at what his decisions, he didn't get many wrong. What is it with uh, cricketers and umpires? What's the real relationship there between the player and the umpire officiating? I mean, there's swings and roundabouts. They get them right, they get them wrong. And does, does it really even out? Yeah, it does, to be honest. Um, I actually genuinely think that uh, the elite umpires, the, the best, um, would have been 96 97%, something like that, correct? Um, so yeah, look, we had a great relationship. You have to have a relationship with the umpires. You know, you're out there, uh, you know, they're taking your sweaty uh, sweater off you and uh, you know your cap and what have you, and uh, you, you, 
talking about it, used to always sit down with a couple of the umpires in the, my early days, Kenny Palmer at Somerset, uh, Bill Alley, you know, the old umpires who played the game and were, been on the circuits and been internationals. And you learn a lot from them. So, yeah, there's a good relationship. Um, obviously, you get the occasional idiot that, you know, we'll just ignore him or let him know and then ignore him. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, no, most of the umpires internationally, uh, the elite were all pretty good. All very good, to be honest, not pretty good. Fantastic. Uh, this next photo uh, we'll put up. Everybody will certainly recognise him. Um, yeah, tell us about Viv. You've certainly got a special friendship with, uh, with Viv. Uh, tell us a, a bit about him. Well, the best player I've ever seen. Um, uh, in all formats of the game. Uh, great, great mate. Um, we, uh, he's godfather to my son. Um, we, we, everything we do together is competitive, it's fun. Whether we played football in our early days or we're playing golf, as you can see there. Um, just uh, an amazing guy. Um, Ebony and Ivy. Ivory. <laughs> you know, we, you know, just, uh, just, just great mates. Um, everything clicked. Um, and it stays the same way. And, you know, it's the kind of guy that if I don't see him, like during this uh, pandemic we've had, I don't see him for, say, six, eight, ten months or a year even, it doesn't matter. It's just the same old, it's as if we've been there all the time together. It's just automatic. And my mum used to do our washing, we used to take it over in the car when we were playing at Somerset. We'd arrive on a, a day off in the morning, dump the, all the washing, you know, which could be about two weeks, so the pen and ink a bit, but they uh, dropped it all off. And we go out and go down the pub for a couple of hours or whatever. Uh, I'll go and catch up with some mates in Yeovil and uh, then uh, go back home and mum would have it all ready there, laid out for us and packed and off we went back to Taunton. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, it, it, it's the families, you know, his mum and, and dad and his brother, Mervyn, uh, you know, we all interlinked, you know, it was, it was, it, it is fantastic. And he, he is one of the most remarkable guys uh, that I've ever known and um, thoroughly proud of what he's achieved um, and as I say I, 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 I can't uh, lack lyrical uh, any more than saying he's simply the best. Excellent thanks Ian. Um, off topic a little bit get away from cricket just for a moment uh, you've got an interest in racehorses and uh, there was one one day when you guys were batting and your great mate Alan Lamb and wanted to know the results of the races. Um, you're out in the middle having a bat. Can you tell us that story? It's quite uh, quite famous. Yeah, look, the the, uh, the phone, that was with Dickie Bird as well, actually. Uh, Dickie was out <laughs> there in the middle. And that played, I think it was Brent Bridge against um, Pakistan, and we were playing in a one-day game. And, yeah, Lammy, uh, usual story. It's a long story. I won't go through it all. But uh, basically, he... Um, said, listen, I was talking to the bookmakers in the, and I said, right, um, I want 50 quid each way on uh, Guisey, rely on Guy, she was called. And I said, uh, Guisey, um, 50 quid each way. Lammy goes, hey, he looks on TV and he's looking at it. He said, hey, she looks really good, eh? Lacka, lacka, looks really good, man, eh? So he uh, says, put on 50 for me. And then they went to the, they walked out of the parade, they went down at Ascot, went down, uh, to the uh, uh, starters, and she went down there, and she looked good. She's she was in great nick, and uh, and Amy goes, "Oh Jesus, beefy, put another fifty pounds on, eh? Looking good." So I put another fifty quid on for us. Anyway, she long short, long and short, she got beaten by a, a head, and uh, uh, incidentally, so, um, Lammy wanted to know what happened. He said, "Listen, I'm going. He's got to go out and back." And the race was just coming, so he doesn't know the results. So I just sent it out, and I put it in his pocket. You know those mobile phones when they first came, the size of bricks. Yeah. yeah. So he just shoved it in his pocket and said, "I'll give you a call." <laughs> and he said, "You can't do that." And when you go out of the dressing room at Trent Bridge, it's wall-to-wall -wall punters. You can't. There's nowhere to dump it. So he goes out there and he gave it to Dicky, put it in Dicky's pocket, and said, "Listen, Dicky, if it rings, take a message." Now Dicky still doesn't. I don't think he knows how to use a mobile phone now. 
And, uh, you know, he's still putting pigeons out of windows, Dickie, but uh, with notes on them. But uh, no, he, um, so it rang. So what I did was I waited, waited, and then I just pressed, I had to get it all right. And Wacker was bowling, like a unison he was, came running in and uh, pressed send. And he's just about to bowl and the thing exploded in Dickie's pocket. Um, oh, hell, that loose. Uh, we should have actually, uh, nowadays, you probably, the keys would be thrown away, wouldn't they? Yeah, <laughs> but certainly wouldn't when Dickie was interviewed about it, they just he just said, turned around and said to them, "Hey, uh, no, 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 no." He said, "I had an open neck. It was a lovely um, hot day, and this this bee went down my shirt front. That's why I stopped the game." And, you know, so he covered for us. He was great. But <laughs> we could have all got. It, it, it's very hard to do it to a screen. But I, if I'm if it was on stage, I could give you the whole show. But it's um, it was very funny. It was very funny. Um, and we still don't know how the balcony was uh, still in one piece because it must have been going like this with everybody jumping around and thing as the phone went off. But no, those are great stories. You know, they, 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 it gets um, it, it brings back great memories. Actually, to be honest, you wouldn't get away with it today. Just that last comment about great memories. It's a great leading to this next photo that I want to show because history may never have happened. Now, this is you in a soccer uniform. Um, you know, you made your test debut in 19, 1977. You wore cap number 474. And you finished in 1992. Yeah. You also played professional football between 1980 and 85. A few mm. seasons, you made 11 appearances uh, in the football league for Scunthorpe United. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about soccer. How did that come about? And were you torn between soccer and cricket? And could Sir Ian both of them may never have come to pass had he chosen a soccer path? Well, um, I had to make that choice at uh, 15, at the age of 15. Um, at that time, uh, uh, Crystal Palace, who were um, uh, in those days were a very good side under a manager called Bert Head, and a uh, very, very good team. And they wanted me to uh, sign for them. And I sat down with my dad and I said, what do you reckon? He said, I'm going to be honest with you. He said, oh, you're a better cricketer than you are footballer. My father was a very talented sportsman. And I listened to him, thank goodness. And uh, I actually uh, turned professional uh, at the age of 16. But I registered with Somerset when I was uh, 12, 13, 14, something like that. So, um, yeah, I, I love my football. I'm president of the club now. Uh, we're, we're not, we've got a young side um, we're struggling a bit at the moment but uh, we'll hang in there uh, but I loved it I loved the, there was no central contracts uh, in those days so you had to earn a living and uh, so football paid you know, the old envelope in, a, in the shoes and by the way tell the taxman seven years have passed so he can't come out with me but, um, but no they used to get the old envelope put in the, uh, the old boot and uh, I played a bit of football, loved it. Um, uh, it was just uh, very special. Um, I remember playing, I played one game, it was uh, Boxing Day, and we played against Hull City at Boothry Park, the old ground, and it was sold out, 17, 18,000, sold out. And uh, I played centre-half, marking one of the hardest players in the uh, league, a guy called Billy Whitehurst. So any of your people watching this that, they look up Billy Whitehouse, he was a handful. And uh, so, I'm, but the next morning after the game, I'm on the plane flying to the Caribbean to Captain England against the West Indies. And I've got to tell you, Billy Whitehurst might have been tough, but those West Indian boys, <laughs> I'd rather play Billy Whitehurst every, <laughs> every other day rather than, you know, that was quite an experience because that's when they really peaked, I think, West Indian cricket. Yeah, they had a few stars yes, in there. Yeah. Hmm? They had a few stars in their team back in the day, the West Indies. Well, they were the best. Look, I've always said that I think that side of that period, the West Indian side was the best that's ever played the game. And then people say, well, they didn't really have a spinner. I said, well, when the hell was the spinner going to bowl? <laughs> because when you've got Roberts, Garner, uh, Croft, uh, who else? It was Andy, Holding. Joel, uh, Holding, Holding. And so there's your four. And you had that four coming in at you. Well, spinners, they didn't need spinners. They used to get about 600 runs with their batting lineup, then bowl you out for about 200 and bowl you out for 150. And the game was all over in three and a half days. They, they were just uh, formidable. Uh, and I don't think anyone really got the better of them. Yeah, you wouldn't like to be captain telling one of those four that they've got to go off to put a spinner on, would you? 
No, and also, yeah, can you imagine this rotation lock? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't get that either. But anyway, that's another subject. We won't go down there now. But uh, yeah, but um, but no, I, they they were in my reckoning the best side I've ever seen. Um, who's the best cricketer you've ever played against, and why? Viv Richards. Viv. I played I'm lucky enough to play against him, but more importantly, with him. We started our careers on the same day, first class careers. Uh, when he came over, and uh, we both de debut in the same match, we uh, uh, he would have dominated in any era, any format. Imagine him in T Twenty. <laughs> he would have been. He'd awesome. be, have been absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, uh, that's remember cricket. <laughs> Sorry, the cricketer you least <laughs> liked. The cricketer you least liked and why? If you can say, uh, gee, I really don't really didn't really not get on with all, most players. Um, yeah, to be quite honest, no no one ruffled me that much that I would. Uh, I, I, and I never saw eye to eye with Ian Chapel, but uh, that's just that's the way it is. Uh, but no, gee, I, I think the great thing about playing uh, cricket. Uh, and touring as we did and the way we used to mingle with the players you know just sit in the dressing room and the Aussie boys would come in with a slab of beer or you have a couple of cold ones at the end of the day's play you learnt more in that dressing room listening to people like when I first started uh, DK Lilly Rod Marsh Greg Chappell listening to these guys talking uh, was it was something you just sat back and enjoyed and absorbed and listen to what their thinking was and how they go. And it, was, it, it did a lot. Um, I think it helped, it certainly helped me. Um, and also, you didn't need match referees in those days. It was all sorted out. If there was a problem, it was sorted out in the dressing room. But nowadays, the teams don't have that um, same connection. Um, but I certainly think a lot of the stuff that he learned and a lot of the attitude and the mindset of the game came from sitting in dressing rooms. Well, certainly in those days, it was, you know, you'd go to war together all day and when the when the day finished, you'd end up in each other's dressing rooms having a few mm. beers, usually a couple of durries and a few stories and, you know, you mm. come back for war the next day. But I, I just don't think that that's the same anymore. It's very regimented. Which is a shame because um, apart from anything else, you make bonded friends. You know, I love playing against AB. We mentioned him just now. Great competitor. Great leader of men. Uh Tough as uh, old boots, you know, nothing flustered him. Um, and you build a relationship. And, you know, if I go to Australia, when I land, he's one of the first people I ring up. Uh, where are you, mate? What's going on? Uh, let's catch up and have a whatever. And whether we go golfing, fishing, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the same with Dino. Whenever I landed into Melbourne, he knew I was coming because I'd let him know. And uh, we catch up. So, I don't think there's that same bond now. No. Um, who scared you with the ball? Who was it that scared you? Anyone that bowled to me in the nets. I hated nets. I hated going in the nets. Uh, I just felt in, it closed in. Um, uh, too much going on. People back in there, people back in there, people walking around. Uh, I hated nets. I, I, I only went there when I was under severe pressure to go in there which wasn't very often. No, so you mentioned with lots of people around too much going on, I take you out to the middle of the MCG, the Ashes test, 100,000 people screaming oh. and ranting. There's lots of distractions Yeah, that's there. right. Just no, a different no, you, type you, of you, you hardly hear them when you're out there. You hardly hear them. You know, when you're out there, once you walk onto that grass, um, the moment takes over. You know, you, you're there. I mean... I didn't mind, you know, as I often said, you know, there'd be a hundred thousand screaming convicts wanting to kill me, you know, when I walked out of the MCG, but, you know, I loved it. I loved it. And you, you absorb it. You know, it doesn't, if it intimidates you, you're in the wrong job. That's true. That's true. Actually, yeah, I loved it. I loved it. What's, what's your greatest memory of Australia from a cricketing perspective, first of all? Um, do you know, if you're an English player or an Australian player, I think the thing that comes to mind is yeah, it's, it's all it's great to beat Australia in England, but it's even greater to beat them in their own backyard. And yeah. I think that's the same for all players, England and Australian. It's the same feeling. You want to win away. 
and uh, lucky enough to do that on a few occasions. Um, yeah, th that would probably be the highlight. Um, yeah, I, I, look, I, I'm a great believer in test cricket. Um, uh, I'm not a massive fan of T20 and stuff like that, but I know and understand that we play it and it's a necessity for the income of the game, etc. I understand all that side of it. But for me, test cricket is what it is, test cricket. It tests you over five days. It tests you mentally, physically. Uh, it, it is the ultimate challenge. And what, what I would say to people is if we ever, you know, I was talking, there's people talking about, oh, we'll make test four days. Stay away from test cricket, leave it alone because that is the ultimate test. And everybody I judge in uh, the world of cricket are people who've done it in the test arena, not the T20 arena. I look at test cricket and that's where the real players and the best players can play in any of those formats. Um, you, you'd you'd um, be the odd person that wouldn't fit. You know, actually, someone like Jeffrey, Jeffrey Boycott, great test player, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't have uh, featured in T20 cricket. Uh, but most of the players around the world would, uh, most of them would um, be able to adapt uh, Jeffrey's game wasn't built around that. That's just a different kind of format. It's uh, there's a few players. You know, you, you look at some of the players, um, Australian, you know, Bill Laurie. I couldn't see Bill playing T20, but I could see him playing Test cricket all day and every day. Thanks, so, to me, Test cricket is the ultimate challenge, and it's the game that needs to be preserved. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, you get to play a lot of golf. Golf is one of your passions. And to us mere mortals, yeah, we classify you as a celebrity. And like my son was lucky enough to, to play around with you or caddy for you. Who's the who's the celebrity of, of all time that you've played with? Who is it that just the wow factor? I can't believe I played golf with him or her. Well, like, I'll tell you what I did do one day, which was I thoroughly enjoyed. I, I caddied for Ian Woosnam playing uh, in a uh, charity event with Jack Nicholas. So there's the, the, there was Jack and uh, Woozy and I'm carrying the bag and and then we had eight to the best, best four hours of my life, I think, in, in golfing terms. Uh, fantastic to listen to someone like Jack Nicholas, who's my possibly, probably my all time sporting hero, um, to actually be in that close proximity and to, to actually uh, intimate conversation um, it was great. And then sat in the, uh, sat in the uh, dressing room afterwards. It was a bit like cricket, really. We just sat in there and had a cold beer and everyone uh, chatted about the golf course, about the game of golf. And I was fascinated because it's, I love the game of golf. Um, I think that golf has actually set a great example uh, to the rest of the sporting world. You know, they police themselves, which is good. Certainly a game of integrity and uh, playing yeah. with the golden bear. Certainly couldn't get much better than that. What's the, yeah, what's the greatest, what's the best course you've played uh, and the course you'd most love to play? Well, I've played um, Augusta. Uh, I've played Augusta. I played on the Sunday before the tournament, so it was all roped and the stands were in. Uh, played with Woozy. Um, golf course left to play. Um, I love playing in New Zealand. I spend a lot of time in New Zealand with the wine, but I also spend it. And Jack's Point is an amazing golf course. Uh, but I played there. I don't know. Um, I think Lynx courses appeal to me the most, but not so much down in the Mornington Peninsula because there's a lot of brown things that crawl through the grass and <laughs> like um, very keen on them. Um, so New Zealand will always get my vote because there's no snakes and no spiders. Snakes, yeah. Poison, so. I'm yeah, I'm very happy. I've, I've been at too close to too many snakes in Australia in the rough, but it's my fault because I had it in there. But then nowadays, it's it, it's it's funny when we played at uh, Q in that time, and uh, there's the, the there's a sign <laughs> down the side of this hole that uh, uh, there's been sightings of uh, snakes today. Oh, I, I I hit it 400 yards that way rather than going that way just to avoid that one bit. No, I, I don't get on with those things very well. No, you can leave them alone and, and they're okay and that's that's where they need to be. Um, well, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like a thousand miles away, that would be good, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. What's your, we're pretty much running out of time. Um, what's the best school yeah, you've had go and where was it? Go fishing. Uh, 
Steve. I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> What's the best score you've had, Ian? The best? Score. What, golf? Yeah. Uh, yeah we're not interested I, in cricket. We're all about golf at the moment. No, 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 no cricket. Everyone can read about the cricket. Uh, golf, no, I've, I've, shot, I've shot a couple of uh, one and two unders, but that was when I was younger. Now, um, if I can get round in mid-70s, I'm very happy, 80, 70s, 80s. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I suppose everyone wants to, you know, I'm, what am I now? I'm 64. I'm not going to shoot 63, that is for sure. But I'm 64, <laughs> so when I get to about... 80 if i do get to 80 then it might be quite nice to shoot 78 or 79 shoot your your age and better but um you know i just love the game that it keeps it's very competitive keeps me competitive um and uh, you know i play with my grandson the one we were talking about who plays rugby right he stands up on, and hits down a par five he'll hit a driver and a seven iron i'll be hitting driver three wood seven iron and that's how the, you know, the, day, the game changes. So you just got to adapt to it. So a little bit of gamesmanship, a little bit of chat, getting the heads. But uh, no, I love it. It's a it's a competitive game, and it keeps you it keeps you going. On. It keeps me going anyway. Yeah. Well, there's certainly uh, three great courses along the Yarra River that uh, next time you come to Melbourne, you will be most welcome at uh, Q Latrobe and Greenacres, and I will certainly extend that invitation to you when you do come out. I will take um, you up on it. I will take you up on it. Absolutely. Now, um, we are going to finish up now because you've been more than generous with your time. Uh, the story is no, no, no. It's fantastic. And uh, you are on your way out fishing. Uh, what, what's your fish of choice? What's, what's the one you like to catch and then eat on the way home? I'm um, fishing for salmon at the moment, Atlantic salmon in the rivers. Uh, had a 16-pound bar of silver yesterday, so I'm itching to get back down there. I've got a war wound from it as well, anyway. Uh, but no, I am... Um, no, I'm going uh, down to the river. It's uh, five minutes away, and yeah. it's not raining, thank goodness. But it is, you know, it is what it is. So we'll get on with it. But no, try and get another winkle one, or, one or two more out today. Absolutely. So I'm sure that you, it's the thrill of the catch. But I'm, I'm sure most exciting also to toast the river. Um, Ian Botham, thank you very <laughs> much for your time tonight. On behalf of early morning for you, 9.30, 10.30 in the morning over there. But on behalf of, of all the members here at Green Acres, Q and La Trobe Golf Clubs, thank you very much for participating, being the bookend of this uh, three webinar series. As I said before, to have a gold medalist, a Victoria Cross winner, and a sir and a lord and a baron, uh, we've pretty much ticked all the boxes there. So, Sir Ian Botham, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. And uh, to all, all everyone watching, um, stay safe, play golf, have fun, and hopefully I can join in in a few months' time. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Thank you all. Uh, thank Cheers. you, members.